Well, uh, I'm Joe Kelly. I'm a native of Maine. Um, I was the state's marine geologist in the Maine Geological Survey for uh, about 15 years before uh, politics got to me and I took a position at the University of Maine where I have been ever since. Originally in the School of Marine Science, but now in the Earth, well, now with the School of Earth and Climate Sciences. Um, when I was a state's marine geologist, we just studied everything. You know, I was very much an opportunist. When there was money available, I, I went for it and uh, acquired a lot of equipment to study the bottom of the ocean, uh, side scanning sonar, seismic reflection, multi-beam bathymetry, ROVs, grab samples cores. Um, unfortunately, we haven't worked a lot in Frenchman Bay. Um, as you might suppose, when money would hit, it would always be focused at southern Maine. And as we worked our way up the state, it would peter out, and it, it always did. But we have done some work here, and I've had students do some work here. So I'll go through this, and I'll just talk about a range of things. And uh, I don't know if, how you want to do questions, if uh, you want to ask me. We can, yep, and then I'm open we're to still going to have a panel discussion after a break, uh, which might be a good time to uh, start um, mulling over where where do we head next with the information that we've gotten, but specific questions about the presentation, go ahead, and we can do them right after. Okay, well, any questions, no okay. problem. I'll, I'll kind of move quickly because I, I drew a lot of slides in here. I won't talk much about rocks. These, This is the bedrock geological map of Maine. Every color is rocks of a different age. Uh, but some are also compositions. The blue ones are granites or granite-like rocks, which uh, I'm sure you're familiar with around here. And the rocks are old. They're, uh, you know, 350 million years old. And they haven't done much except erode in all that period of time. They've just sat there and layer after layer of material has been eroded and carried away, most recently by glaciers. But geological activity isn't over. You know, there was an earthquake, and that was just one of the rock falls over on uh, Champlain Mountain was a, just a few years ago. I actually wrote a proposal to go out there and, and study it. I have reasons for it that I'll get to a little bit later. Uh, this just is a slide I made up for that proposal, which I have to say wasn't funded, but uh, showing where the earthquake was, what its size was, which is really large, and the fact that there were multiple earthquakes was very surprising. Uh, the fault uh, actually is very near the Earth's surface. It may rupture it. No other fault in Maine has ever, no earthquake has ever come to the Earth's surface. Uh, it dips, it, it, it outcrops, it comes up and down the axis of the bay, and the, the, the moving uh, plane dips down below uh, Mount Desert Island. Uh, my interest in it, uh, I'll, again, I'll come to it, but what, what it did to the seafloor is my interest, how it might have disturbed it. Next in line, next thing that happened in our, in our history was we were glaciated. And I've shown this slide uh, from some work I did in Glacier Bay, Lynn Plue Glacier, uh, and said, well, this is what this area looked like 15,000 years ago. I mean, that would have been Cadillac Mountain, and, and there would have been glaciers there. And the ocean would have been much higher than it is today because the ice weighs a great deal, uh, and its, its weight is capable of pushing the crust of the earth down, about one foot down for every three feet of ice. The ice was certainly over the top of the mountain originally, it was over Mount Katahdin, so the Earth's crust was deeply pushed down and the ocean uh, invaded. Uh, when the glaciers left, um, this, was the, this would have been the edge of the ice, the margin of the ice as it retreated and backed up more or less in that direction. But one thing that ice does is it leaves piles of material, big linear piles of material called moraines, and, and it did that. There's a picture of uh, Sprague Neck in Machias Bay, uh, which is oriented right across the bay, and that's, that's the take-home message. These moraines are many of which are underwater today, but they would have blocked off most, if not all, of these bays uh, after the Ice Age. It would have formed lakes, lakes everywhere. Uh, we have plenty of lakes in Maine, but uh, where we have ocean water today, near shore at least, up to uh, less than 200 feet deep, there were a lot of lakes that are now underwater. Uh, just some of them here. Here's a, a glacial moraine. The ice paused here, then here, here, then here. Uh, Jordan Pond still has its right there. Uh, Somme Sound lost its, and I've been interested for some time in uh, uh, when that lake transitioned into becoming a, a body of ocean water. So, sea level was higher than present. This uh, field trip stops that I take a couple times a year. Uh, this is Monument Cove in Acadia National Park, and this beautiful sea stack, which is bedrock. It's, uh, it's still attached, but there was a cave there and an arch, and it's gone. And here you go up uh, Day Mountain, 
to what has uh, been come known to some geologists as Shaler's Rock after a famous geologist who studied it, uh, marking the high stand of the ocean as the glaciers left. Very similar coastline, a boulder beach, there's ocean mud, there's shells and all sorts of things, but it's about 60 meters or about 200 feet uh, above present sea level. And that's because the land was pushed down. World sea level was actually very low because there were still glaciers in Canada that hadn't yet melted. But the land was pushed down and so the ocean came in. Uh, a map that I had a student make a number of years ago and, and one that a friend of mine made. This amber shows you the extent of the ocean intrusion, including all the way down the St. Lawrence, all the way into Lake Champlain. And at this point in a class, I usually ask them, what is the state fossil of Vermont? Does anyone know? I mean, I actually was floored. Somebody knew once. It's a whale. And it's a whale because a farmer in about 1810 was plowing his field near Lake Champlain and came across a, a, a massive whale in the mud. And that's because it was ocean mud uh, some 15 odd thousand years ago. While this area wouldn't have been all water, there was there were plenty of high points, although my house uh, certainly would have been underwater. And, and it would have been a con continuously changing um, scenery. It wouldn't have looked like that for more than, than a moment. I work underwater, and this is just uh, one of my graduate students with some of our equipment. Uh, we tow devices in the water. Um, this yellow cable goes to a device that's actually underwater that sends sound out to either side that images the bottom, captures it, brings it back up, and you can see it displayed in black and white. But it's like looking at the bottom from an airplane in black and white uh, without the water in the way. Uh, this other device over here um, sends sound through the bottom so I can look at the layers beneath it. And um, often I'm looking to drill a hole in those layers to look at some of the geological history. Uh, it isn't in Frenchman Bay, but it was the most recent project I had in this area. Um, people who were dragging for scallops were picking up uh, these artifacts, these points uh, over in the Bass Harbor. And they were coming from uh, pretty much the same areas. Uh, an area out here, uh, and an area in the inner area uh, near Bass Harbor, enough so that I was able to get a grant and go there to see, you know, was there any kind of a site there? Uh, was there anything that was left behind? Um, what I really want to do is, is drill holes, and this is our, our underwater vibracore. It's a long uh, steel pipe with a plastic liner inside, and at the very top is a, a device that has three um, mutually perpendicular eccentric cams. It vibrates. If you turn it on, it would vibrate your bones right out of your skin if you touched it. Uh, but what we do is we lower it to the bottom, turn it on for about four seconds, and it, it just sinks down six meters, uh, stop, pull it up, and we pull out the liner, and we look for shells, particularly clams uh, that are in life position uh, and were buried dead, you know, buried alive, and are still there. And I know that they probably live near low tide, so I can do a radiocarbon date on them and, uh, and know where sea level was uh, when it was at that depth. Well, this is, uh, uh, we did some multi-beam bathymetry, probably put out, uh, oh, I don't know, 40 million bathymetric soundings. And these just appear as little bumps on the uh, nautical chart. But in fact, they, you can start to see that there's structure to them. Uh, you can see that it looks bumpy to the left of this ridge and bumpy to the left there. Predominant wind into this area, but Bass Harbor is to, the, is to the upper right there. Predominant direction that the wind comes is this way. When sea level was lower, uh, this was an eroding piece of property. It was, it's a glacial deposit, that's why the boulders are there. And it was eroding like our coast is today. Uh, and it swept some of the sandy part of the material that eroded out and formed uh, beaches called spits that just uh, connect land and, and, and go in. Another one connecting between them called the Tombolo. Uh, and it, it would have been a great place for people to live. It would have been a lake and then later a, uh, an estuary. This is some of the shorelines that are still evident there. And those would have been my targets to go in and, and core some of these. Uh, those are the eroding glacial deposits. Those are the beaches. Uh, and that was the river. There would have been rapids coming down into it. It would have been just a perfect place for Native Americans to go. I, I can't quite reach it, but the, uh, the tip of this yellow area is where the, uh, a number of the tools came from. I didn't mention it, but if you look at them, I've held them. They're remarkable. They're really sharp still. They don't have any marine, um, like a, you know, anything attached to them that was living, suggesting these were buried, which 
makes it <laughs> they wanted to go, we have a remotely operated vehicle, you want to take pictures of the bottom, it's a big ocean and it's, you know, it's funny, fun for the first five minutes, even the first half hour, you know, get another cup of coffee, but three or four hours into this and we were planning for two weeks, it is dreadful, we could have gone by anything down there in the bottom and everybody was falling asleep, so we didn't find anything, but we did, oh, you want to, you can do that, thank you very much. Um, well, we did. I collected a core, and I'll just show you there were a lot of them like this. Um, this is the length of the core, there's the top, it goes to there, there's a meter and a half down, and there's uh, almost three meters down. This particular photograph is of this area here. There were lots of uh, oysters. Oysters were the dominant shellfish in this area until global cooling took them out uh, sometime later. There were some, um, some clams and some mussels also, but these were all intact, right where they lived, one oyster on top of another. And the radiocarbon dates were all pretty good, except this fragment, which didn't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, but then it turned muddy, and, and this mud had a lot of grass fragments in it, and hearing you talk about uh, um, uh, eelgrass, Zostera mariners there. Yes, yeah, sorry. Are the dates uh, calibrated no. or radiocarbon? Those were, the, actually, I put this slide together when I first got it. Calibrated has changed. I'll plot them in a second. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, uh, but you can see, when I, I was just blown away when we peeled this mud apart, you can still see the, uh, the, the eelgrass was still green. Uh, it was just remarkably well preserved. Very hard to get a sample off the date because it was compressed so much, but uh, nevertheless very, uh, very remarkable. But then eventually the ocean came up and drowned it, and, uh, and there it is. This is a graph. This is how sea level has changed in Maine from lots and lots of cores, lots of uh, work. Um, there's today, here was about 15,000 years ago, uh, here's contemporary sea level, at sea level, but in the past when the glaciers were retreating it was much higher. Uh, it was higher because the land was pushed down. Once the glaciers melted, the land fell rapidly uh, as it's falling today in Hudson Bay or Glacier Bay or Scandinavia. And uh, it fell to what we call the low stand, the lowest point it would go to, about 12,500 years ago. There are actually some additional dates from southern Maine. I don't put them on this graph because it might have been slightly different here. And then sea level rose, uh, the Bass Harbor study of these colored dots in here, into a period we don't fully understand why, uh, but sea level didn't go up anymore. It was going up everywhere else in the world, but here it wasn't. The land was, was, was adjusting. It was going up for reasons that I, I can't can't tell you, but, uh, and then it rose rapidly after that and has slowed down until about a hundred years ago, at which time it's begun to, uh, to rise uh, really rapidly. Um, so some of the work we've done here, I actually had a student, he, I need to find a project, I got some money to look at the seafloor of Frenchman Bay and this whole area, I focused on the, the shells out here, uh, you know, the sand beach has seashells that make it up. You know, it doesn't happen much this side of Florida. It does on a few beaches uh, in this area. Uh, and we wanted to see if, what was offshore. What did they look like? So we went out and we, we made a map of the whole area, but I'll just, I think I'll focus on that one spot. Um, this is an acoustic image of the bottom. Here's the track of the boat going over it. The sound just goes out either way. So you can just think you're looking down. Um, you can see the bottom. And you can see these large ripples. Uh, they would probably be mm, 20 centimeters or so high, lots and lots of them, probably caused by storm waves, uh, hard areas, some rocks, some hard bouldery glacial deposits. Um, we did core out here, uh, and what we got was shelly material, just like the beach overlying an ice age uh, deposit. Actually, we, we, didn't, we didn't date that. Um, but that sample, that yellow dot we, we pulled up was all, pretty much all shells and um, so the, the offshore, the reason there's so much in the way of, of, uh, of shells in, in that area is that there's, there's nothing else. Uh, so there's nothing to dilute it and there's a lot of exposed rock and waves just bring that, the, 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 uh, the shells right up onto the beach after the, the organism dies and, and it can accumulate. This is the extent of the, the data that I've collected in this bay. Um, these are side scanning sonar lines as well as seismic reflection. So I'm looking at the bottom, and that is the scale to which we did it. It doesn't show the Bass Harbor work, 
Uh, up here, it just shows a number of seismic reflection lines. And some of the other things that we saw, this amber or whatever color, this yellowish color, is natural gas. And I'll talk a little bit about that. There's also a lot of natural gas isn't seen, but it, it is in here also. So we didn't get thoroughly through the bay. In fact, we hardly got through it at all compared to some places we've worked. But it might be something that we could be interested in looking at again. I won't go into a lot of detail, uh, shells are on the bottom, and this was an area that my student made for his master's thesis, showing the extent of the shells, that they're mostly in relatively shallow water, under 20 meters. Um, we looked at the amount of sand and, and the mud, the mud obviously increasing a bit offshore. Uh, the shells are concentrated though in these areas right in here, uh, which is adjacent to where there are beaches. Um, well, the ocean, I mean, what's going on today, the ocean is rising, the coast is eroding relatively slowly compared to uh, some things, the rocky areas are eroding hardly at all. A lot of caves, though, are forming over an iron-bound island and, and at Schooner Overlook, used to be called the Nemini Cave, um, suggesting that, uh, you know, we're seeing our coastline change. This is what I was interested in, this is why I wrote a research proposal about the earthquakes. Um, you're looking right here uh, at uh, a seismic reflection profile. So um, here's the seafloor, and I'm sending sound through it, and I'm seeing bedrock and then an ice age deposit, GM. But I don't see anything through this. NG is natural gas. It's methane, and there's a, a body of it here, and there's another larger one there. Uh, and it's common enough along our coast. And I thought, wow, look at the way it even seems to be bulging the seafloor there. Um, this would be, you know, a, suddenly with all that shaking, there's a real shot that, you know, maybe it escaped. And then what I have seen in other areas is where gas escapes, large craters form. And I didn't bring that talk with me. Worked mostly in a little bit in Blue, Blue Hill Bay, but a, a lot in Belfast Bay. Belfast Bay has almost 3,000 uh, of these pockmarks, these crater-like areas. This room would be one of the smallest ones. The biggest ones are the size of football stadiums with the stands, 350 meters in diameter, uh, 40 meters deep. The phenomenal things. And there's thousands and thousands. It's the defining feature of Maine's uh, muddy offshore bays. And I thought, well, ha, that maybe is the earthquakes is how they form, and maybe there'd be one there, but, uh, but we didn't get funded to do that, so, so we don't know. That just shows you the extent of gas uh, along our coast, all these green areas of natural gas, where we've worked. There are none in the sandy bays to the south because the gas bubbles out, but um, every muddy bay I've really looked at, and in fact there's a lot of them in this area, uh, and many of them have pockmarks. All of these in here do, all of the Blue Hill area does, some sound, uh, the Belfast field, uh, and probably many areas down east where you know, the, money, the money ran out, we actually never worked there. How did they form then? Oh, here's the ice, it's melting back, sea level is high, um, it's often called the De Geer Sea, and ice age mud deposits go down, and then the ice leaves 10,800 years ago, sea level has fallen, lakes exist out in what was the bay, and certainly Frenchman Bay was full of lakes. Uh, lakes are places where organic matter, carbon, uh, accumulates on the bottom, and then, um, the ocean comes back up, it goes over it, and, um, and new mud starts to cover that, and bacteria begin to break down this organic matter the way they do in, in landfills, and turn it into methane. And there it is, in Belfast Bay, that methane just erupts, or has erupted, to create this lot, these large uh, um, pockmarks. Continue on, uh, rising sea level still going on, and I've been wondering uh, where, where might some of these wetlands be. Maybe this is even how it happens. This is an aerial photograph looking uh, down. This is uh, the road coming onto the island. I think the oceanarium is, is right over there. Uh, and what you see here, when I saw this, I just said, money. This will be a research project in a minute. <laughs> this is a freshwater bog, and that is a salt marsh, and they are abutting one another. What could be more incongruous? Uh, uh, a bog that relies solely on fresh water, cannot tolerate any salt, and the ocean right next to it. And, and I finished a study, I actually just finished it this year with a, a graduate student here, as well as at, uh, it's a common enough scene along the main coast. My expectation was 
that uh, this boundary you see from the road back here was rapidly transitioning, because it's, but it isn't. It's, it's not even measurably changing over, since the aerial photographs in the 1950s. Why, I mean, now, why is that? I'm not sure why. I think that there's enough water that comes into this and flows out that it simply holds the salt water back. I have other devices. One is a ground penetrating radar that lets me look through the land, and it, but it doesn't look through salt ever. Um, and I, as I ran it across here, what I found is that there's salt water that goes quite a ways underneath. Now this is a raised bog. They, they, these this plants are, are meters up in the air, and the living part isn't in contact with the bottom, and so it, it doesn't care that there's salt water under there. So there seem to be mechanisms that permit the ocean to to come in here without changing the boundary. My guess is it'll tell us something catastrophic, a really big storm that throws salt water up on top and, and it kills it, and then it probably jumps forward as a in, in a big step. Um, another sign of changing conditions, changing sea level, uh, near Taunton Bay, or the entry to Taunton Bay up here at the, uh, at the Narrows, the reversing falls. Uh, I don't know what you see when you see it, but I see a glacial moraine oriented the way the, the glaciers were melting back, and I see one that has eroded, and that was once uh, a barrier, and that Taunton Bay was clearly a lake, and, and it burst, but what really strikes me is that it's still eroding. I mean, this, the, the bluff over here is still eroding, probably on both sides, uh, is that it, it hasn't eroded that much. It happened recently. I don't know how recently. I could find out by coring into uh, Taunton Bay and looking for the transition from ocean, uh, from um, uh, freshwater lake deposits into ocean deposits, but there were you know, major Native American sites on both sides, you know, because of the, the, the anatomous fish, probably. They might have been there before there was much of a freshwater lake. There would have been a rapids. This would have been the outlet. But, but this is how every estuary in Maine has formed, with, with lakes becoming drowned and the shoreline just moving in big jumps in a, in a landward direction. So very interesting area. So I will end up here, uh, but I'll just say one thing. Great place to work, uh, but not really very well, very well studied. There's a program in the federal government called the uh, National Estuarine Research Reserve Program. Um, 1972, with the Coastal Zone Management Act, every state was allowed to have one research reserve where they put, uh, you know, several million dollars a year. They build a research lab and a visitor center. Their, their goals are research, education, and monitoring. And that's it. They have no regulatory management authorities. Um, well, it's, every state has one now. Even several Great Lakes jumped on the bandwagon. And, and, um, but there's, there's also a caveat. Ours is in Wells. Unfortunately, Wells, Maine is a salt marsh. It's a barrier beach and a marsh atypical of Maine. has nothing to do with our coastline, much more like the coastline in Massachusetts and New Hampshire to the south. But there's, another, there's a caveat to that, and, and that the law actually allows every bioregion in the, in the coast to uh, have a, an estuary reserve. And, and some states have three. Florida has three bioregions, three reserves, Texas two, California's got a bunch. Um, there's only one bioregion in the lower 48 states that does not have an estuary research reserve, and that one extends from Canada to Portland, Maine, the biggest stretch of coastline. Uh, so, I'll, I, I've talked about this in a few places. Um, there are a number of places that would be interesting. I've always thought Frenchman Bay would be a great place for such a reserve. The Dan Scott Estuary is, is interesting for other reasons, but it's something you might consider, and I'd be happy to talk more about, about it with you at another time. So, thank you. Thank you.